Okay. Okay. See you guys in the middle. I'm going to give you a 10 or a 5 and sure. I kind of keep it down low. Um, trying to get that far, I don't think. But should be a red run there. I, I agree. I just, um, they're really asking that I keep everything yeah, on the schedule. No problem. So, we'll definitely uh, so keep it down. Do you guys need anything? Yeah. I think okay. I got a water. Happy. People are just going to sit down at the same thing or standing up? What I think we're going to do. Um, you're grabbing the mic and having it as wireless. You can walk around. Okay. Uh, I, Obviously, don't have a clicker, so yeah. uh, we can take turns. Okay, that's fine. Sure. I'm going to uh, I'm going to race the restroom, and then we get really close. I'm going to shut the doors and try to get a quick little bit talk, and then okay. see you guys. Good Perfect. Yeah, we don't need okay. very much at all. Okay. okay. We're self sufficient. That's good. But if you need it, let me know. Okay. Thanks. And the food. Yeah, that's nice, right?
Messing with it? No, I was messing with it. Come on. What do you think I am? Some sort of hacker? Well, they're going to, uh, they're going to cut off the front end, anything on the front end. Okay. Before you start. So it's, it's going to be, uh, okay. I was just doing it to basically make sure I could. Yeah. We never go any client secrets or anything. I don't think so yet. <laughs> it's fine. Anything before you release? Know, What's up? start our uh, 12 o'clock talk. This is uh, again the red team briefings. This is going to be hacking the iPhone applications. And here you go. Cool. Hi, how's it going? I'm uh, I'm Kevin Stadmeyer, and this is Garrett Held. Together we are uh, eh, messing up our slides. Yeah. Uh, together we're managing consultant for Trustwave Spider Labs. Um, we performed hundreds of application tests from mainframe to web to mobile. Obviously, we'll be focusing primarily on the mobile talk um, today, um, and we're going to go over what we're going to cover. Um, secure coding and beyond what to look for when assessing an iPhone application. Um, so the primary target of this talk is going to be um, both pen testers and application developers. Hopefully, if you're into either one of those groups or both those groups, you can get a little bit of value from this talk. Um, first things first, we're going to cover the basics, um, you know, what exactly we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to do a setup for testing. We're going to figure out uh, how to test this stuff. Then we're going to do secure storage of data and credentials. And then finally, inadvertent uh, local storage and caching to kind of talk about places where the iPhone is saving information that you may not be expecting it to. 
And then we're going to go into some more classic examples, things like uh, client-side sanitization, things that we have to worry about in you know, web development as well. Um, you know, secure code guide guidelines, how those might differ from traditional applications. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about push notifications. Uh, and then a lot about, you know, some more on secure communications. And then we'll try to sum up in conclusion uh, how you should be approaching these applications as a developer and as a tester. So, the basics, just the facts. Why are people attacking mobile applications? Well, why does anybody attack anything? Well, there's really three main reasons, we think. Um, the first reason is stealing money, right? People don't do this um, for fun that often anymore. It's, it's a big business. Um, stealing money, stealing credentials, credit card information, etc. cetera. Um, embarrassing people, um, hacktivists. So I mean, there's always a lot of news around anonymous and low sec and the rest of it. Um, and you know, a million other groups out there that are trying to get their cause, uh, de celeb out there. Um, you know, the most recent one probably is going to be um, the Komodo hacker, the Iranian hacker who stole the SSL certificates. Um, and you know, these are people who are not hacking necessarily for money, um, but either out of sense of patriotic duty or because they think there's some injustice they want to write in the world. Um, the last one is to get famous, right? Just put your name out there, like, I'm the guy who broke PayPal's uh, application. I'm the guy who broke Bank X application. Um, it's just a question of Mobile applications are ultimately just an application and a smaller device. Um, the reason we kind of got started with this is because um, we had a client who asked one of our sales guys if we knew anything about mobile apps and these new iPhone, newfangled iPhones. And of course, our sales guy, being a sales guy, said, of course, we have some guy who does nothing but mobile applications all day long. And then he said, Kevin, you're good at mobile apps, right? And I said, yeah, absolutely, sure. Um, so I started doing a lot of research and kind of getting into it. Um, and it was very interesting to me. And so I kind of did a lot of independent research along with Garrett. Um, and we've taken what we've found over the last couple of years, um, both for our clients as well as independent research, and kind of put together in a cohesive talk to hopefully spread the wealth. And so, yeah, that's another big goal of this talk, is not uh, securing the device itself or talking about the operating system. It's going to be you know, making sure that you're not the weakest link in the chain. Um, and so, you know, the reason we don't want to talk about the device is there's been all sorts of things in the news and there's plenty of research around that. Things like uh, the ability to just plug in an, a stolen iPhone into a computer, jailbreak it, uh, you know, upload some scripts and it downloads the keychain and you can start cracking that then. Uh, and you can get access to all sorts of username and passwords. Uh, and so one of the things we're going to talk about is making sure that you're assuming that malware is on the device and that uh, it'll have access to some of this information. Yeah, I mean, it's always good to assume a default insecure state um, when you talk about applications you put it on a customer's device, because um, the majority of the time is going to be true. The device is going to be compromised in some way. Um, so two other kind of high-risk issues that came about. Um, one, and we'll kind of talk about w the great implications of this, but essentially some guy put out an iPhone application in the App Store that purported to do one thing, and what it really did is it stole a user's iPhone's lock passwords. Um, and so he was a security researcher, ostensibly. Um, and he said that he did it in order to better understand what people use for their iPhone passwords. And we want to guess what the number one iPhone password is. 9999, anybody else? Four zeros. 1234, anybody else? That's right. So 2580 is the number one iPhone password. Just right down the middle, 2580. Second is 0852, and then they also have 1234, 9999, and 0000. Um, so what's the lesson from this, right, is people pick bad passwords. Um, that's something we've known in the security industry for a very long time. How many people here have an iPhone? How many people have a four-digit numeric password for their iPhone? Right? Because it's kind of a pain in the butt when you're walking down the street, you're driving to log in and check your email if you have a multi-character 16-digit password, right? So a lot, it's a lot easier to have, you know, 1234-2580. And so um, even we who are in the security industry we should probably know a little bit better, um, generally choose convenience over security. So it's something you have to be aware of when you work with sensitive data on the iPhone. Um, another prominent hack that's a little bit older now was the pay, uh, PayPal's iPhone app. We'll talk about what the root causes of that were also. Um, but essentially what happened there is that PayPal um, created their application so that it was easier to use in the development environment. And they did this by getting rid of the SSL certificate check. Um, and then they rushed to production and guess what they forgot to remove? Um, the code that to say was that SSL certificate check. So that means anybody can man in the middle of this application. Obviously it's me a bad time if you're a PayPal um, developer. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot of kind of the common causes and effects of all these iPhone applications. And we'll go from there. Um, so just the facts, ma'am. 
how are people attacking mobile apps? Um, new and unsafe operating systems. Um, you know, you have these new OSs coming out. iOS is a new OS. Android is a new OS. They're constantly being developed. Um, people make mistakes when they build uh, new OSs, new software. It's just the way it goes. Um, it's just, you know one of those things. There's kind of an apocryphal story about how when they built Windows Vista, they wanted to rewrite a lot of the networking code from scratch to clear out a lot of the rubble, I guess, that was in the Windows networking code. Um, but the problem is people who wrote the networking code for Windows Vista um, weren't the same people who wrote the fixes for Windows 3.11 back in the day. And so you had, in the first beta versions of Windows 7 or Vista, a lot of things like teardrop attacks and smurf attacks um, and just kind of really, really old attacks that people fixed a long time ago and people forgot they had to fix them. Um, so we're kind of seeing a little bit of that with operating systems. Um, terrible developers who don't care, uh, maybe, right? I think that if you were a developer who don't care, who doesn't care about security, um, that may or may not make you terrible. Um, it really depends. Uh, clueless users who don't know they should care. I think this is probably most users. You know, most users don't have an idea of security in their mind, um, or they may, you know, watch something on Good Morning America or whatever morning show there is a view about, you know, iPhone security and are hackers stealing your children's secrets online, you know, more at 11. Um, and that's really the extent of the security knowledge. Um, but I think that, unfortunately, most users don't really understand it. So you can't rely on users to protect their information. You have to protect it for them. Uh, what security models are we not talking about? Uh, we're not talking about the first layer, which is the Apple Store. Um, we're kind of touching that briefly. Um, but we're not going to be really discussing that in depth. And we're not going to talk about sandboxing via the seatbelt. Seatbelt is just kind of the Apple term for a sandbox environment in the iPhone. And basically what it does is it prevents the iPhone applications from ostensibly viewing or modifying other applications data on the iPhone. However, if the, uh, if the device is jailbroken, then the seatbelt doesn't work anymore. So we're going to assume, again, that it's been jailbroken. Yeah, talking about, talking about iPhone apps. We're not talking about Safari. We're not talking about OS vulnerabilities. Just straight up iPhone apps day in, day out. Okay, so setting up the testing environment. Oh, so you know, uh, what you know, do we mean setting up the decompiler? No, we're not going to be reversing any binaries in this presentation. Um, there are lots of good research to cover that. Uh, however, you know, we just don't have time, uh, and we don't think it's you know going to be the most common vector of attack. Uh, however, we will talk about in the best practices section, you know, making sure we're minimizing what information we're storing on the device, both in databases and in the application code itself. Yeah, I mean, reverse engineering and decompiling applications is fun and all, but um, you know, the, ne the reality is that there's enough low-hanging fruit out there that attackers can fully compromise your users and your servers without having to even bother doing that stuff. Um, okay, so how are we going to test an iPhone application? Let's say you have an iPhone application, either one that your company has written um, or one you've downloaded from the iPhone store. Uh, if you download an I application for the iPhone store, it's important to note that the IPA file is compiled for the ARM architecture of the, uh, um, the A5 chip on the iPhone. Uh, so it will not run verbatim in your desktop computer. Um, so that's why the simulator is called a simulator and not an emulator. For the Android, it actually is an emulator because the APKs will run, they compile for an Intel processor and they'll run on both environments. With uh, iPhone, it's not true. Um, so if you have an application from the store, you have to test it on the phone. If you have your own application, uh, it becomes a lot easier to test and it's a little more um, a little more worthwhile. So first things first, we have to get a proxy set up. Um, so this is Burp. You can use anything you want. You can use Web Scarab. Um, you can use Paros. Any proxy you want doesn't matter. Um, what is important is that you set it up if you're testing on the phone uh, to a support invisible and b um, disable loopback only. And the reason you want to do loopback only is because you're going to be running the iPhone on the local Wi-Fi network, the same network as the computer running the proxy, and we're going to proxy all the requests from the iPhone through that proxy. The next one, we have to get the certs. Um, this one is fairly straightforward. You set up your proxy. You set up your web, your web browser to point through the proxy. You go to some SSL-enabled site. It pops up a little window saying it's insecure. You view the certificate, and then you have to make sure you click on the root level certificate. So if it's burp, it'll be the port swigger CA. You export that certificate as a PEM file. Um, it has to be a PEM file. You can't use another format like DER. Um, the iPhone just doesn't recognize it. So you export it as a, as a PEM file, you save it somewhere. Um, the easiest way to get the cert on the phone is just to email it to yourself. Um, super easy way. You click on the cert and it'll install automatically. Um, this does sort of open up some questions about how you are going to handle um, 
social engineering attempts. You know, is it possible, can somebody send a certificate to somebody and will they click on it and install it? Um, well, if there's one thing I've learned in computer security is that the answer is yes. Somebody will always use something no matter how stupid it seems to you. Um, you know, there's always that 1% who's going to click on the spam for whatever. And that same 1% is going to click on the cert and say, oh, it's free money. I'll definitely install it. Um, Apple does do a decent job trying to prevent that. Um, you can see here when you first click on it, you get this not trusted. And it says install profile, contains a certificate. What does that mean to the average user? Exactly nothing. Um, what does it mean to security? You should maybe recognize this and you can figure out what it means. We also have a second follow-up that says the authenticity of Portrait CA cannot be verified. Installing this profile will change settings on your iPhone. Uh, installing the certificate of Portrait CA will add it to the list of trusted certificates on your iPhone. Again, what does that mean to the average end user? A whole lot of nothing. I think that Apple should probably change this warning sign so that it's more direct, so that they're saying warning, installing this will allow people to view your network traffic. Uh, something a little bit more kind of I guess, uh, recognizable to the average user than just saying it's a, another cert you're installing. OK, so then on the phone, you go to general, you go to settings, general uh, Wi-Fi network, and then you click on the Wi-Fi network you connect to. There's my network, ABC Superfun. Um, and you connect to the manual proxy. Put in your, uh, your server. You can see it's just a local um, uh, it's computer on the local network. Set up the proxy. Um, turn off authentication and then make a request to your website from the phone. Um, if everything is set up correctly, the server is installed correctly, you should be able to view an SSL website uh, with no warnings, and you'll see it in Burp. At this point, it almost becomes like a standard web application and web services test. Um, if you've done a web application test using a proxy before, it will be very familiar for you. Um, if the application is using HTTP for the communications to the server, um, it's a very straightforward process. Okay, so on the computer machine, let's say you want to use the simulator instead of the emulator. Um, there's a lot of advantages to using the simulator. Um, you can have a lot more access to fun tools, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, as well, as just, it's just easier to test things on the simulator versus having to fiddle around on your phone um, and make it work that way. Um, so the first thing you have to do is you have to modify the iPhone simulator uh, key security or trust store um, SQLite database. SQLite database, um, very simple. You can use any SQLite management software you want. Firefox actually has a plugin um, called SQLite Manager, and it's sort of odd that you have to install a plugin to web browser to control a SQLite database, but it works well, so who am I to complain? The Apple Store will also sell you one for $20 or something. Yeah, so if you want to pay 20 bucks to Apple, we'll go for that. Um, or you can get it free for Firefox, hey. Um, so the first thing to do is you open the Trust Store at SQLite 3 database. You go to the T settings table. Um, and then you can see there in my very small screenshot that you have to um, take the SHA-1 fingerprint of the root CA certificate. So when you export that certificate, you open it up in the keychain tool if you're on a Mac. You look at the SHA-1 fingerprint, copy and paste, and you put it right into the table. Um, the format is not just the SHA-1 fingerprint. It's going to be X single quote SHA-1 fingerprint without any spaces, single quote. Who knows why they have that format? They just decided that's what they wanted to do. Um, at this point, you have the certificate installed in the simulator. Um, if you try to proxy an SSL website through the proxy, uh, you won't get that pop-up saying the untrusted certificate. It'll automatically trust any certificate your proxy serves up. So you have all that. Well, then what do you do next? Anybody recognize this icon? What is it? What did you say? Yeah, some Xcode. It's actually the instruments tool that is shipped with Xcode. Um, and instruments, I think we heard of sys internals from Windows. Some people. Instruments is basically sys internals for Mac. Um, super, super, super handy if you're doing a pen test either against a thick client or in this case a mobile application. All you have to do is you point out the PID of the running uh, iPhone application, attach it to that PID, and then you can view everything it does. Um, so you can attach it to the PID and you can see things like uh, file activity, um, IO inputs, directory IO, file attributes, core data, which is um, a method that the iPhone uses to store data um, securely. And then you can attach it to that PID, you run the application, run through it, you can see all the places it's writing to disk, all the places it's reading from disk, um, all the network operations it does. It's a very low level look at how the application works. Um, this is the example of sort of information you can see. Um, so you can see here this highlighted, highlighted line. Um, this happened when I went to a website and then I pressed the home button. Uh, when you press the home button on an iPhone, it takes a screenshot of the screen and it saves it to the directory. Um, so you can then go on the file system and find that screenshot. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the insecure storage and local caching of data. 
Uh, so, you know, typically how you store credentials on the device is going to be with the keychain. Um, however, the keychain is going to provide uh, some form of indefinite storage. Um, you know, so if the application is installed, you install some sort, you know, credentials with it, uh, and you remove the application. The keychain has no way of knowing that the application was removed. So they're going to stay on the device. Um, you know, can you can you store uh, credentials securely without the keychain? Uh, you can. You know, don't let that feature make you lazy. However, uh, you know, don't uh, store credentials in the keychain unless you don't care about certain things. Uh, like we'll mention a little bit. Um, you know, an attacker will have access to that once they jailbreak the phone uh, if they have physical access to the phone as well. Uh, and so here we have a keychain compromised uh, through uh, jailbreaking. Uh, so through a series of steps, you know, they retrieve the password stored in the keychain. Um, they jailbreak a stolen iPhone, something they picked up at a bar, probably left by an Apple employee there. Um, <laughs> game you know, plug it in, gain secure cell access, copy the scripts over to the iPhone. Uh, it compromises the keychain and the scripts output the victim's password then. Uh, so, you know, where should you store them? Uh, not on the device, at least not in plain text. Uh, this is from uh, the SQL Manager, or SQLite Manager again, uh, the Firefox plugin. We opened up one of the databases and found things like uh, usernames in there from a bank uh, application. Uh, so you want to be very careful what you're storing in that database, because an attacker, you know, who jailbreaks the iPhone will have access to that information. Yeah, I mean, we're very cognizant as consultants that a lot of the times we'll go in there and we'll see an application and we'll say, you're doing it wrong, fix it. And then it's easy for us to say, fix it. It's harder for you as a developer to actually fix it. Um, and so I think that's a big problem with consultants is that they'll suggest a course of action, but they won't give you um, the tools you need to continue on the course of action. So being cognizant of that fact, we kind of thought about a little bit how you want to securely store data at rest, um, things you might want to look for. And so when you're reviewing an application uh, or you're reviewing your own application, uh, you know, you want to look for database calls, make sure injection's not possible. So even if they don't jailbreak the device, you want to make sure that they can't get to the information some other way. Um, if you're using core data or any database, really, you want to make sure that that's another, um, you know, trust boundary that you're authenticating that information again. Uh, you don't want to trust things implicitly that come from the device. Uh, as I'll say probably a couple more times, you want to imagine that it's uh, jailbroken, malware's installed, and it's running off the DEF CON network. Um, and then design an application from there. Uh, yeah, so recommendations for our non-credential data. Uh, don't store it on the phone if at all possible. So you know, never has it been so easy to lose so much so fast. Uh, you know, these hold an enor enormous amount of information, and if you lose your device, that information shall be considered compromised at that point. It's just a matter of time. Um, you know, require a user to enter a passcode. You know, this can still be brute forced uh, once the encrypted text is found. Uh, and it usually provides a poor user experience on mobile devices. Um, especially, you know, you know, the more steps they have to go through to access your application, the less likely they are to use it and go to a competitor. Uh, so let's say we have a large amount of information on the phone, and we want to store it on the phone, not in the cloud. Uh, but we want to make it secure in case the device is lost. Uh, we could reverse the process. Maybe we want to store the key out in the cloud. So somebody has to enter a passcode. It goes out to the cloud, gets a much larger key, so they use a pin code or something like that. Uh, and that way, if the device is lost and reported stolen, uh, you know, you can remove that key from the cloud and they won't be able to access it even with the pin code. Uh, however, that will require some sort of always-on connection. Uh, so they won't be able to use it in airplane mode or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously one of the big benefits of having a mobile phone is that it's a mobile phone um, and then you can use it anywhere you want. Um, the problem is that if you start making requirements on users like you have to connect to the network, um, you maybe get some pushback from the business unit. Um, it may not be in line with their user experience expectations. Um, it is a very secure way to do it though. So it kind of comes down to um, do you want to have a usable application or do you want to have a secure application? Um, and there's certainly ways to kind of do it in the middle, um, but the secure storage of Credentials isn't one of the ways you can really get, have too much give on between usable and secure. Um, so then I say don't store credentials in the key in the keychain because you can access it when, when somebody steals a phone. And people always say, but, 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 key sec attribute accessible when unlocked, right? 
Um, and this is an attribute that is on by every piece of data you store in the keychain. It automatically has this uh, attribute, and what it means is exactly what it says. It says the attribute is accessible when unlocked. Um, so when the phone is unlocked, then this information is also unlocked in the keychain. Um, if the keychain is locked, um, you know, the user, if somebody steals your phone, they are going to have to know the PIN in order to get into that keychain information. Um, but then we think back to that, uh, the list of iPhone uh, passwords you talked about before, and by default, most users' passwords suck, right? I mean, I'll admit it, my password sucks. Um, it's four-digit numeric. There is not that many. Um, you know, look familiar. This is the number one, you know, lock screen. Most people, are, again, are not picking complex 20-character passwords with upper and lowercase special characters. Most people are picking four numeric digits. Um, most users, you know, news of the world, um, they stole a lot of voicemail just by guessing pins, essentially. Um, you know, if you have a simple pin, there's only 10,000 possibilities. Uh, if it takes, if you can crack 100,000 keys in a second, which is about right for a dedicated cracking machine, that means you can crack an iPhone pin just by brute forcing against the offline database in about a tenth of a second. Um, so that's not exactly what I would call secure. Um, if a journalist can hack your pin, then it's probably not secure. Hope there's no journalist here. I think the last time there was a journalist, he gave me a dirty look. What? Yes, that's true. That's if somebody has a phone and they're just trying to plug it in. But if they actually steal your phone, they jailbreak it, and they pull the keychain off, and they're brute forcing it offline, you don't have that same protection. So that um, that protection, and what he said was that the phone will allow you to have a setting where you put in the wrong pin too many times, it erases all the data. And that's fine against a casual attacker. You know, somebody picks up your phone in a bar, and they just want to steal your phone because, hey, it's a free iPhone. Um, but somebody who's going after it because they say, you know, you are the CISO for a bank, and I want to know all your email, um, and I'm going to steal your credentials through your keychain, they're not going to be just trying to guess it randomly. They're going to download the keychain and try to brute force it offline. That is a good point. Um, so, storing credentials, protecting stupid users. And, you know, stupid users need the most protection. So, uh, you know, your application should require some sort of strong password. So, A plus character is often numeric. Uh, and that's going to have to be a business decision, of course. Uh, and it's going to, you know, may harm the user experience, but if the data is sensitive enough, you may want to take that precaution. Uh, you know, use real and good encryption, uh, not stuff your nephew wrote, not uh, lot 13. Uh, you know, don't rely on inherently insecure pen to protect users. I think we've, we've covered that a couple of times as uh, the weaknesses to that. Uh, you know, and if the users knew what they were doing, we wouldn't be here today. Um, like you saw earlier in the Apple example, when you install the certificate, it makes them go through a few steps to at least slow them down a little bit to make them think about what they're doing uh, before they install a bad certificate. I mean, I always think of a typical user like my mother, and God bless her, I love my mother, of course. Um, but the other day she calls me up, she's on her iPad, she goes, Kevin, uh, it says I have Windows Security Scanner found 17,000 viruses, and I tried to click the button to take it off, and it didn't go anywhere. It didn't work. I think I have all these viruses on my iPad. I said, okay, Mom, I think it's okay. Just be careful in the future when you do that. Um, so, you know, even when it's obvious to anybody who knows anything about security, um, that a Windows Security Scanner on an iPad is probably not a legitimate pop-up. Um, that just doesn't really, it doesn't really click with most users. They don't, they don't make those connections that somebody who's a little more tech-savvy may make. Uh, Inadvertent local storage and caching. So we talked before about I uh, ran an iPhone application, I attached the PID, in this case it was just Safari, uh, and then I pressed the home button and we saw that PNG file being written to the disk. Um, so what exactly is that PNG file? Well, that's a screenshot. Um, where are they stored? When are they taken? Who can access them? So I accidentally your data, right? So they're being stored uh, on the local file system um, for an indefinite amount of time basically until iOS decides there are too many screenshots and they need to clear some out. Um, and what that does is that when you close an application on the iPhone, you press the home button, it shrinks down. When you open it back up again, it pulls up that screenshot. And what that does is it provides a very nice user experience for the user. They think, okay, this iPhone is very snappy. I can close down an application over and up right away. They don't realize they're just seeing a picture of the application until the application actually loads in the background and then it replaces the picture. Um, so it's primarily just to make the application easier to use. I think people think the iPhone is maybe faster than it actually is. Um, so how do you protect against that? Um, and again, a very obviously named um, attribute. 
in the info.plist um, that's included every application, there is a setting you can add, and it's called UI application exits on suspend. Anyone want to take a guess at what that means? I know it's pretty tricky. You guys aren't very fun. Come on, what does it mean? It means it exits on suspend, right? So if it exits on suspend, then it doesn't have, then it knows it's not going to come back, and so it doesn't take the screenshot because it knows it doesn't have a snappy experience coming back because the application is closed down. Um, so that means that if you have things like plain text, credit card numbers or credentials, or whatever else, they're not going to be inadvertently stored in a screenshot. Um, other storage of information. Uh, and so I don't know if anybody in here is like me and has turned off autocomplete globally, but uh, a lot of people don't. Uh, I, I think a, a few mingled words is a small price to pay for this not happening to you. Uh, however, you know, it's, it, uh, it tries to correct itself and learn. Uh, so if you keep uh, using the same word over and over again, it's going to remember that word. Um, does anyone know where that word's stored? Or where those words are stored? On the device? So it's got to be somewhere, right? So it's just a file in there that keeps a list of these words that you use. Um, and so an attacker is going to be able to get that list. So we have to assume that you know, autocomplete may be storing data that your users type in incorrectly. Yeah, I mean, in, and for autocomplete to work, obviously all the applications have to have access to it. Um, and so if you don't turn off autocomplete on things like credit card fields, um, it's possible that you could have things like credit card numbers stored in autocomplete. Um, and so this is just a property of the uh, text field where you can set the uh, you know, auto correction to none. So you can make sure that sensitive fields uh, don't do that auto correct, even if other fields in your application might. Uh, and so now we're going to talk about uh, client side sanitization. So um, this is especially popular. You know, we've seen a ton of this in web applications where JavaScript's you know checking it and then just sending it off to the server. That's very popular in you know Flash applications and mobile applications too. Yeah, I mean it seems like it seems like developers. Um, kind of eventually learn their lesson that you can't have quiet side sanitization in whatever technology they're working on, but then they get a new technology, and all of a sudden it's back to magic. And that, oh, I'll do client side sanitization because it's an iPhone application. Who's going to be able to intercept that? You know, you can't put a proxy on an iPhone application. Just kind of common misconceptions that just aren't true. Um, so it's bad. You know, there's less burden on the server. That's good for you. Uh, but it also means that there's less security controls in the server, and that's bad for you. Um, critical bypasses are very common with client-side controls. Uh, so like I said, some classic web application faults are going to translate really well into uh, some of our iPhone applications. Uh, you know, I, we've tested applications over and over, and we still find this today, where they rely on JavaScript controls, hidden fields for authorization and authentication controls, uh, JSON responses we can manipulate, um, and you know, information stored in Flash objects. Same type of thing is going to be stored in a uh, a mobile application that we can decompile, or is going to be, you know, even stored on the device itself that we can directly gain access to without even decompiling it. And so we also have to assume rogue clients. So you know, attackers can write apps. You know, some some of those testers can too. Uh, and so you know, client side secrets can be decompiled, or you know, we could write our own application that doesn't do any filtering, or we can you know, uh, decompile secrets out of the application. Uh, we don't care if it's obfuscated right now. So someone from Apple could stand up and go, you can't decompile this application. We put all sorts of protections against it. Uh, that may be true right now, but in six months, that may all change. And you don't want that information on the device, and somebody in six months just has to click a script, and he has all that information then. Uh, so you know, uh, we also can't uh, rely on it being you know, the Apple Store preventing everything. Uh, so you know, with Android, they have multiple stores, uh, and they've already had malware being sent through there. Uh, with Apple Store, we have to assume that you know, real malware is going to make it through there. We already know rogue ap applications have. I believe there's a flashlight application, also had a secret tethering feature on it as well, which will allow your phone to, to tether before that was an, an option of the operating system. Yeah, yeah and that, I mean, that was pulled by Apple. Um, again, we talked before about that application that still uses passwords. Um, who here has actually submitted an application to the App Store, the Apple App Store? Has anybody? What did they require from you? They said they required one. What did they actually require? A co <laughs> Ultimately, they, they really, in the end, they just require a copy of the application. Um, they don't ask. They don't ask for source code. Um, they don't do 
a walk through the source code. The people testing these applications are not security testers. They're more like QA testers, right? They're checking for naughty pictures and naughty words to make sure that the rating is appropriate, and also to make sure that it's not duplicating functionality in the iPhone, which is one thing they disallow. Um, so just because it's going through the Apple Store, if you are a competent developer, you will be able to write an application that can both pass the iPhone, um, the iPhone Store checks, and still do a lot of really nasty things to the iPhone. Um, and again, a popular way for Android to do it is take the top 20 apps, decompile them, add in Trojans, and put them back on the iPhone, on the App Store for free. And so everyone says, oh, Angry Birds are free, awesome. So they download it, and instead it's a Trojan. I mean, it's not a great situation. Uh, so, you know, how do we do this right? Uh, same as any client server application or web application. Let the server side enforce this. Uh, assume everything coming from, you know, the device was from a rogue client. Uh, and enforce secure communication. So make sure SSL is being enforced or whatever uh, you're using to protect uh, the information being sent across. Uh, and so, you know, what exactly applies in this world? And uh, we're still using this slide. We've modified it a little bit. Uh, so we're going to be worried in iPhone app iOS applications about SQL injection, you know, other injections, privilege escalation, session hijacking, overflows, format string problems, insecure use of SSL. And all those apply to the application and the server it's communicating with as well. Um, you know, cross-site request forgery and cross-site scripting, uh, not as big a deal unless you're using the browser. However, we have some asterisks there. Um, you know, if you're making a direct call to the browser, uh, so this was a recent Android issue, uh, and you send like load JavaScript alert, uh, then you have a cross-site scripting problem in your application. Uh, so embedded browsers uh, in the application may also share web app issues. There's also the problem of rendering HTML in your app, using some sort of engine to render HTML in your iOS application. Uh, and this is what happened to Skype recently. Is, did anybody hear about this one? There's a cross-site scripting where if you put in some sort of HTML into your first name and somebody loaded up this information on you know, their iPhone or iOS device, it would execute the JavaScript. Uh, so the, the, the seatbelt was still there to protect the rest of the iPhone. However, you know, what do you think Skype has access to that might be somewhat sensitive? Contacts. So I downloaded the, uh, sent back the entire contact uh, address book as a proof of concept. Uh, and so if we're an attacker and we're looking at a, an iPhone application, say you write one for a bank and it's on the device, uh, we can be looking at you know, overflows or format string problems to access the device itself, but Typically, what, you know, the greater variety we have, if we're targeting the communications in the server, we're going to do you know, the injections, the privilege escalation, session hijacking, and uh, security use of SSL. And those are all things that you control as developers. And so you know, it's time to throw out any assumption this, that the device will protect you. It won't. Um, not only will it be compromised, it can help you know, an attacker write a malicious client that will uh, provide some sort of uh, you know, bypass of your assumptions. Uh, and a new set of security practices need to be developed when creating these apps. Uh, so, you know, we're shifting paradigms and we're going to talk about these, yeah, we hate ourselves for saying that, uh, talk about each of these areas in a little bit more detail. So, local storage, you know, what is stored and why, uh, educating our QA teams, uh, you know, especially on the proxy testing, but other things as well. Uh, reviewing local and remote inputs, making sure that those trust boundaries from the device uh, itself and from the communications of the server are, you know, properly sanitized, and uh, information leakage that may be happening. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not rocket science, right? It's just an iPhone is just a small computer, an iPhone application is just an application that runs on a small computer. Um, it's just a question of understanding all of the different areas of the application that may lead to data leakage or vulnerabilities that may be present in the application and have your QA team or security testers know about those and look for it. Um, it's certainly something that we can get ahead of um, and there's really no difference between an application on an iPhone and an application on a desktop. Let me get right down to it. Um, local storage review. So you want to review what's stored on the device by the application. Um, the easiest way to do this is to load it up in the simulator, attach instruments to the uh, process ID, and then start watching where it writes to the disk. Um, very, very easy. It shows you everywhere the data, uh, the data is being written, everywhere it's being read from. Um, it's a very easy way to get a comprehensive view of all the information. Um, another way to do it is to do a source code review. 
Um, that's also, again, very easy if you can read Objective-C. Um, it's just a question of what you have access to and what sort of level you have access to for the application. Um, I, should, I should point out that for the simulator, um, when you want to do a simulator test, let's say you um, are working with a vendor who's created an iPhone application for you and you want to do a test of it, they're unwilling to give you the source code for a variety of reasons. Um, but you can get the compiled um, simulator build. So when they build it in Xcode to test it on a simulator, it creates a little folder in the iPhone simulator. They can zip that up and send it to you. You drop it into your simulator folder, and the app is automatically installed. Um, there's not a very complex process to it. Um, and at that point, you just have a compiled binary. Um, it's essentially the same as the binary that will go on the phone, but compiled for an Intel architecture versus an ARM architecture. Um, so a vendor really shouldn't have any complaints about providing that compiled binary. Um, you want to review what's stored on the device by iOS. So not only what the application is storing, but also the screenshots, the autocomplete, etc. You want to make sure the autocomplete is being turned off with appropriate text fields. That's a lot easier to do in a code review. Um, when you have access to the binary, you can just go ahead and start typing things into all the text fields and see what autocompletes. Um, it's a very easy way to see it. Um, keep it simple. Review to remove, right? So this is kind of... I think the overarching idea of security is that we want to keep it as simple as possible. I think complexity adds security problems. Um, if you can keep it simple, if you can review to remove, it makes everyone's jobs a lot easier. And so we also need to educate uh, QA departments, if you have one, um, or whoever's going to be testing the application. Uh, you don't want them just picking up the iPhone, typing in a uh, single tick uh, drop table. Oh, no, it's not vulnerable to SQL injection. Uh, I'll try a cross-site scripting payload. OK, no. This iPhone application looks okay. Um, so we have to tell them about you know, setting up that proxy environment, uh, the different inputs that will go into it, and how to test those. So local and remote inputs. Um, user input from apps is always a concern. right? That's, that's kind of security 101, especially for web applications. You don't want to trust anything coming from a user. Um, anything coming from the user into your server can be manipulated. Uh, no matter how amazing you think your special scheme is, ultimately it's going to be broken. Um, same reason why DRM really doesn't work, because at the end of the day, you have to give them the keys to decrypt the content and the encrypted content. Um, so eventually they're going to find a way to, to crack it. Um, you know, we talked before, you can write your own applications. The people who are writing um, viruses to steal this information are not doing it from their mom's basement. You know, they are organized criminals. They go into work every day. They have go to they have go to production, push meetings, they have go, no go decisions, they have great tech support. Um, little side note, there's a Trojan called Zeus, which is uh, used for botnet, uh, and it's famous in the underground for having great tech support. So if you buy Zeus for $10,000 and you can't just infect that millionth machine for some reason, you can call them up and they'll walk you through it. Um, so these are organized businesses. They have serious resources. Um, don't forget about responses that could be intercepted or hijacked, right? So if somebody could hijack it, if you're not checking that SSL certificate, um, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, and then finally, maintain the integrity of the device. This is difficult to do, to say the least. Um, there are a variety of ways you can do it. There's things like um, MDM, which is Mobile Device Ma uh, Policy Manager. Um, you can try to check for a jailbroken iPhone before your application starts up. There's lots of ways to do it. There's just as many ways to defeat those checks. Um, so the end result is that you should be assuming that everyone talking to your server, every app talking to your server, is a rogue application. Uh, information leakage. You want to examine all traffic to and from the application, like should be done with web applications. Um, a common thing I see is that people will say, OK, great, we have this mobile banking uh, site. Let's go ahead and make a mobile banking application. Um, and say, OK, well, we have this whole site already set up. The service is already set up. Let's just send all the information to the iPhone, and we'll take what we need out of those responses. Um, if that's the case, it may be the possibility that your, uh, your server is sending too much information to the iPhone. If somebody is able to intercept that traffic, maybe they could use that extra information you're sending that you're assuming nobody has access to um, as sort of information gathering to help them attack your servers later on. Uh, additional examination of what sensitive data may be in the binary. Um, is it necessary? Keep it simple, review to remove. A good example of this is that I tested a financial transfer application on the iPhone, um, and they had decided that they wanted to be super secure. Um, so the way they're going to be super secure is that they only allow the official iPhone application to get a session ID from the server. And the way they enforced that is that they would do a, um, they had a simple symmetric key on the device, and the symmetric key also on the server. They would encrypt the timestamp of the symmetric key. If the server got a response or request for a session ID that didn't include the encrypted timestamp, then they would deny it. Well. 
a couple problems there, right? A, the, I, the application was free to download in the App Store, so anybody in the entire world can download it and get a free and get a you know a valid session. Um, the other problem is that it's the secret key is being stored in the binary. You know, we talked before about how DRM doesn't work because you have to have a key and you have to have the uh, encrypted content. Well, similarly, you have to have the binary. We ran the binary through IDA and we saw a secret key function that just had the secret key in plain text. Um, so it's very, very obvious. Um, we ultimately recommended the client take it out because it didn't add any security. And we worried that if somebody had downloaded this application and ran it through IDA and they saw such an obvious blunder that they would then take extra effort to kind of find any extra holes that are in there. So, you know, it's, you want to make sure that you only have what you absolutely need in there. Secure coding. Uh, and so now we're going to talk at a high level about some of the things um, that we found that lead to these vulnerabilities. Uh, however, you know, secure coding, especially for the iOS, could be an entire day or more of uh, instruction. But uh, you know, who thought buffer overflows were gone? Uh, I was kind of hoping they were, uh, but they're back in style now. Uh, Apple's bringing them back. Uh, so you know, we can arbitrarily execute uh, code loaded uh, onto the device. Uh, and this could bypass the seatbelt if we do. Uh, so how do we do it right? You know, same concerns as in C. Um, we'll be checking uh, boundaries, uh, things like that. So, and we want to use appropriate uh, functions. Has anyone here heard of uh, STRL copy? As opposed to STRN copy to one person? All right. Um, so you have to like check the, the Apple um, uh, instructions. And there's a uh, link down there to the uh, developer site where you can see uh, some of the recommended functions as far as how to do these string operations securely. Um, but these improve upon already what's considered secure functions. Uh, you want to use properly uh, uh, calculated buffer sizes, so using constants. Uh, and this includes integer bounds checking as well. So we don't want any integer overflows. Uh, and format string problems, again, anything that we had in C, we're probably going to have on the iOS device as well. So you know, application displays user input, uh, as they're known to do. Uh, it uses some you know, NS str uh, string with format option. Uh, you, can, you can use the printf function. Uh, and attacker sends, you know, percent s, percent s, percent s, percent s instead of hello. What do you think is going to happen? It might crash, it might just get into the NS, basically it says take data from the stack and read it off. So you can start reading data from the stack, you can use other tokens to kind of NS, start writing data to the stack. Printf. Uh, vulnerabilities are very dangerous. They're kind of deceptively dangerous, um, but you can easily allow the hard to So how do we do it right? Uh, just like uh, web applications, we're going to enforce the secure coding standard. Uh, no vulnerable function should accept untrusted user input. Uh, so when we have a string format vulnerability, it's usually we have printf, paren, and then the variable, and then a paren, like printf, you know, argument one. Uh, and that's where we get into trouble. However, if we properly format it uh, and reference the variables, uh, then it's fine. Okay, so here's an example of something that did go wrong. Um, this was an application we tested. Um, and a couple things it was doing that wasn't immediately obvious from the perspective of our application pen test. Um, so these are things that are happening on the server. Um, and it kind of explained the issues that we had. Um, so one thing it did is that it manages the state using the device ID, not the session ID. So the session ID was being passed back and forth, but on the server, um, it would accept the device ID as a session. Um, the other issue is that the session was not terminated properly on the server side. Um, so when you click log out, the server continued to exist. Uh, the session continued to exist in the server side. Um, so this led to a very interesting vulnerability. Um, the following conditions were met. We can go back, actually. Sorry. Um, the following conditions are met. The user logged into the application. Um, once they logged into the application, at some point in the last day, they subsequently logged out. Um, the attacker then tries to log in again. The attacker supplies the wrong credentials through the mobile application. Um, and then they, uh, the application then requests a session state update or a refresh while waiting for the incorrect login to be sent. Um, so, for instance, Garrett logs into the application. Uh, he leaves his phone in a bar somewhere. I pick it up. Um, I then try to log in with the incorrect credentials. Um, and the server says, OK, let me check these credentials against the um, authentication database. While the server is waiting to make that check to get the response back from the database, um, the iPhone application then said, go ahead and refresh my session for me. Uh, the application server 
would then say, okay, refresh the session. Okay, I don't have anything for this J session ID, um, whatever the session ID was, but I do have something for your device ID. And so this must be your active session. So I'm going to go ahead and log you in at this active session. Later on, the authentication server would say, no, it's not actually them, but by then it's too late. And the application has logged you into the server. Um, so it was a very interesting um, interesting bug to find because you know one of the first things we do when we test an iPhone application is try to bypass the authentication. So we did this, got the application, brand new install, tried to bypass authentication, no luck, okay, we'll leave that alone. And then sometime later on, we went back and tested it again, and now we were able to bypass authentication. Um, and so that was difficult to find out. What we ended up doing is we had to get a whole bunch of people together, and they looked at all the different logs on the servers to see what was being done with each request, and it ended up being that the, uh, the server was using the device ID, um, which the application developers claimed not to be aware of, but that's a little bit suspect, um, and they were able to compromise the session that way. So how do you do it right? Um, you have to have strong server-side controls over access. Um, policy enforcement on current concurrent logins. Um, so if somebody logs in again with the same session ID, the other one should be logged out. Um, do not maintain the session ID via the device ID. Um, in iOS 5, actually the UDID, Universal Device ID, is gone away. Um, but the problem with the device ID is that everyone says, okay, here's a device ID that is unique to each phone. I will use this to track my users, right? Um, and it should be secret and it ends up being sent over the network in plain text to a variety of applications and games. Um, and uh, it's, it's bad, you know, it's obvious. So what can go wrong with servers, you know, just about everything. Uh, you know, just like a client server application, make sure it's uh, uh, protected. So harden the server, same guidelines as I lost for that. Uh, push notifications, this is my research, my friend Nitesh Johnny, smart guy, this is a website, check it out, um, found that in order to do push notifications on iOS, Apple issues you a public and private certificate. Um, you sign the, um, the push update with the private certificate, push it to Apple, and they verify it and then send it out to all your devices. A lot of developers don't understand what a private and public certificate is, and so as a result, they publish it on their website. So anybody can go look for this, you find the website, and you can push notifications to any application you want. Um, just kind of a basic security fail. Um, NSURL, iOS is secure by default um, for SSL connections. Um, the problem is that if you then uh, circumvent that method um, in order to better test or more easily test your device in the simulator, that can cause some problems. Um, we saw that in PayPal, where people were, uh, they took out that uh, SSL check and it kind of came back and bit them in the butt. So you have to make sure that when you go from a simulator environment to actual production environment, that you're actually checking SSL certificates. So review. And so we went over the basics, you know, motivations of attackers, you know, what they're going to go after on the device, uh, how to set up for testing and look for these things, uh, you know, talking about secure storage of data and the credentials. Uh, the inadvertent local storage that the operating system is going to do on its own. Uh, talking about client-side sanitization. Uh, if you didn't catch that earlier, it's bad. Uh, secure coding practices, just the beginning that we can you know, start to build on that. Uh, push notifications, you know, you know, and things that you might not think about. So you make sure that operations is deploying it securely as well. Uh, the end result is that testing is easy, both for you and for them, them being attackers. Security is hard, really, just for you. You have to secure every possible entry point. Attackers just have to find one bug, and they can get all the access they want. Um, so test everything, uh, and be thorough, make sure you're aware of what the problems are. Okay. And we'll be around for questions afterwards. Yeah, and I think actually, yeah, and this one is people just don't test. They don't think about it. They seem, oh, it's on an iPhone. What's the worst that could happen? But yeah, I mean, that's a big problem. Is you want to install, you have to, uh, on iOS 4, it just, the application is gone and all the data that's in its directory sticks around, but it's stored in the keychain, say that information still sticks around. The application has no way to remove it. So it is a very a big problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. If you have more questions, I'll be out.